In this example, we'll be looking at a WT 6x95 that's used to support an equipment platform above a loading dock. The hanger is supporting a beam that is attached using a 2x2 two two pattern of 3 quarter inch diameter bolts. It's designed for a live load of 24 kips, and our goal is to determine the amount of dead load that the hanger can support. In this case, since it's a mechanical platform, vibration of the uh, member is not a consideration. In this example, we'll examine the strength limit states of a gross section yielding, known as a tension yielding failure in the AISC specification, or a net section fracture, known as a tension rupture limit state in the AISC specification. We'll examine gross section yielding on a section cut here, uh, about uh, one and a half to two times the major dimension of the T away from the joint. And we'll examine a net section fracture through the first row of bolts. First, we'll visit table 2-4 out of the AISC steel construction manual where we can find the material specifications for various structural shapes. Zooming in a little bit, we can see that for W shapes or for WTs that are cut from W shapes, the preferred material specification is A992. And in this case, A992 is stipulated in a problem statement anyways. For A992 steel, the yield stress F sub Y is 50 KSI and the tensile stress F sub U is 65 KSI. Next, we'll refer to table 1-8 of the manual where we can find the section properties for WT shapes. And zooming in, you can see that for the WT 6x95, the cross-sectional area is 28.0 inches squared and the flange thickness is 1.74 inches. Looking at the limit state of gross section yielding first, the nominal strength P sub N is taken as F sub Y times A sub G, the yield stress in the material times the gross area of the section. Substituting in 50 KSI for F sub Y and 28 inches squared for A sub G, we get a nominal strength of 1400 kips. Applying a resistance factor of 0 0.90 for gross yielding, we end up with a design resistance phi times P sub N of 1260 kips. Next, we'll examine the limit state of net section fracture, where the nominal strength P sub N is equal to F sub U times A sub E, the tensile stress times the effective net area, and A sub E is taken as the product of U times A sub N, where U is the shear lag reduction coefficient and A sub N is the net area of the section. The net area of the section is gonna be considered here through the first row of bolts as we move from the gross section into the joint. And when we calculate the net area, we take the gross area of the section and subtract out the area of the holes on that section that are made to accommodate the bolts. The area of the holes is taken as the sum of the effective diameters of the bolt holes times the flange thickness. So performing those calculations, we take the gross area, 28 inches squared, minus two bolt holes, each accommodating a three quarter inch diameter bolt with a hole that's a 16th of an inch larger than the bolt diameter. And then we add a second 16th of an inch to accommodate the potential for material damage during the fabrication of the holes. Finally, we multiply by the flange thickness of 1.74 inches, and we end up with a net area of 24.96 inches squared. When we consider shear lag, we're going to use case two out of table D3.1, where U is equal to one minus X bar over L. And looking at table D3.1, we can see that case two would be an applicable case for this situation where we have a T section with one of the two elements connected and the other element not connected. In this case, the flange element of the T section is directly connected to the adjacent member, but the web element of the T section is not directly connected. In our shear lag reduction equation, U equal to one minus X bar over L. X bar is a connection eccentricity, and it is taken as the distance from the centroid of the tension member to the fanging surface of the joint, as is shown here. However, when we look at table 1-8 of the manual, we see that that distance from the surf outer surface of the flange to the centroid of the section is tabulated as Y bar. So when we pull that value out of the manual, we pull the value of Y bar equals 1.62 inches, and we use that as X bar in our shear lag equation. 
So if we uh, substitute 1.62 inches in for X bar, and if we assume that the bolts are spaced at three inches along the length of the member, then we can calculate a shear lag reduction coefficient of U equal to one minus 1.62 divided by three equal to 0 0.4600. However, there is a provision in AISC specification section D3 on the determination of the effective net area that may come into play in this particular case. Looking at that provision more closely, it reads, for open cross sections such as W, M, S, C, or HP shapes, WTs, STs, single angles, etc., the shear lag factor U need not be less than the ratio of the gross area of the connected element to the member gross area. That means that U, the shear lag reduction coefficient, doesn't have to be taken as any less than the area of the connected elements divided by the gross area of the section. In this case, the area of the connected elements is the area of the flange, which has a breadth of 12.7 inches and a thickness of 1.74 inches. So the flange has an area of 22.10 inches squared. Taking the ratio of the area of the flange to the gross area of the section, we see that we get a value of 0 0.7892. So that means that we can take U equal to 0 0.7892 for this member. That's a significant increase over the original value of 0 0.46 that we calculated using 1 minus X bar over L. And this provision reflects the idea that in some cases, we might be better off considering only the connected elements of the cross-section and not considering the unconnected elements at all. To help make that point, consider the cross-section of the WT 6 by 95 shown here. With the net area A sub N equal to 24.96 inches squared and with U equal to 0 0.46, the effective net area A sub E is 11.48 inches squared. Now consider a simple bar with the same dimensions as the flange of the WT 6 by 95. If we calculate the net area of this hypothetical bar, we would find that A sub N is equal to 19.05 inches squared. In this case, however, the shear lag reduction coefficient U would be equal to 1.0 and the effective net area A sub E would be 19.05 inches squared. From a physical point of view, it makes little sense for this hypothetical bar to have a higher strength than the WT section. Thus, a lower bound exists for the shear lag reduction coefficient to address situations like this. Substituting those values in for our net section fracture strength, we take 65 KSI times U of 0.7892 times the net area of 24.96 inches squared and we end up with a nominal strength P sub N of 1,280 kips. Applying the resistance factor of 0 0.75 for a net section fracture, and we end up with a design strength V times P sub N of 960.3 kips. So in summary, we have a gross section yielding strength V times P sub N equal to 1,260 kips, and we have a net section fracture design strength V times P sub N of 960.3 kips. The lower of these two strengths governs, and we end up with an available strength V times P sub N equal to 960 kips. The goal was to determine how much dead load this member could support. So we'll back substitute into the first of our load combinations where the uh, factor loads is, are equal to 1.4 times D and solving for the dead load D, we would be able to support 685.8 kips. Taking a look at the second of the two load combinations where we have 1.2 times D plus 1.6 times L, we could see that we would be able to support a dead load D of 768 kips. So the lower of those two is going to be the governing value, and we can determine that the maximum dead load that that member can support is 685 kips.